Titan, Europa, Enceladus. These tantalizing moons of the outer solar system are promising destinations in the search for alien life. That's why there are exciting new missions currently in the works to visit these mysterious ocean worlds and learn if they might be habitable, or perhaps already inhabited. It's a pleasure to welcome Jonathan Lunin, who is the David C. Duncan Professor in the Physical Sciences and Chair of the Department of Astronomy at Cornell University. Thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. First, I just wanted to ask you what, what first sparked your interest in planetary uh, science and, and astronomy? I remember getting my copy of um, Sky and Telescope magazine uh, before heading over to my Stellar Atmospheres class. And I unwrapped the magazine and there was this beautiful image. It was a far encounter image of uh, Jupiter with uh, Io in front, I think, uh, image by Voyager 1. And it was so beautiful and so detailed that I decided that the kind of astronomy I wanted to do was planetary science. And I understand too that you had reached out to um, Carl Sagan. Yeah, that was huge. I had bought uh, a copy of a book that was reviewed, I think also in Sky and Telescope magazine. And that was his uh, book entitled The Cosmic Connection and Extraterrestrial Perspective. It was the, his first sole authored book. And I, I was just so enchanted by that book, by his vision of, of humankind's connection to the cosmos. Uh, and I was reading it aloud in our apartment. And so my mother finally said, you should write to Professor Sagan. And I did write to him and he wrote this uh, very detailed uh, two page letter on how to become an astronomer. He enclosed some uh, reprints, some scientific papers from the, the recent Mariner 9 mission. And, um, and it just connected me to the field of astronomy in a way that I hadn't been before. Amazing, I love that. Um, you know, when you did first uh, start in your career, Titan was one of the big focuses um, of your research there. And this moon is just so bizarre and weird. Can you just tell us a little bit about the environment that we, that we know is there on Titan? It is bizarre and weird and familiar all at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so Titan is uh, the moon of Saturn that has a very dense atmosphere. It's the second largest moon in the solar system. Uh, on Titan, uh, rather than uh, water being the meteorological or uh, the weather maker, if you will, uh, methane is the weather maker. Titan being in orbit around Saturn is almost 10 times farther from the sun than the Earth is. So the temperatures are too low for liquid water, but there's lots of methane in the atmosphere. And so, that methane forms clouds, uh, it rains, uh, it makes rivers, uh, lakes, and seas. Fascinating. How did you first come to start uh, studying Titan? In the fall of 1980, uh, Voyager 1 flew by Titan. But by the time Cassini finally arrived in 2004 and discovered the lakes and seas in 2006 and 2007, um, it was clear that, that there was not a global ocean. There were isolated lakes and seas. And then um, we, we were able, and I say we because I was on the radar team for Cassini, uh, we were able to design a set of radar observations that actually allowed us to measure the composition of those seas. It was really, it was a remarkable kind of experiment that was devised by the Italian part of our team. Uh, and that experiment worked and combined with some laboratory data, turned out the oceans are the, the seas, I should say, are mostly methane. They do have some ethane in them and some nitrogen, but they're mostly methane. And to that point too, I've always been really fascinated by the Huygens uh, probe that Cassini delivered and, and that landed on Titan, um, such a unprecedented type of mission. Uh, where were you when that landing was taking place? And, and were you able to kind of see images as they came back mm -hmm. from this really amazing landing? So most of the, the investigators were in one large building, but the imaging team was in a separate trailer. These images that nobody had seen before, the, the controllers did not see them. They were just sent as bits of data to our trailer. Um, the computer operator started posting them as, as postage stamps images on his computer. And um, of course, we all gathered around as those images were about to be downloaded onto the computer. and. 
And so we started seeing in rapid fire dozens and dozens of images of the surface of Titan. They were not in the order of the descent. They were sort of in the order they were loaded onto the memory. And so it was it was a little bit like a clockwork orange where these disconnected images were flashing in front of our eyes. It was clear that Huygens had floated over this large hill made of something, ice presumably, into which had been carved these gullies and carved by what? Almost certainly by liquid methane. And so I, I just remember, uh, you know, several of us were screaming because this was an incredibly exciting landscape. It had its own style. That just sounds so exhilarating. I'm wondering, you know, why why would we consider Titan to be habitable? Maybe you don't, but sure. it's often talked about as yeah. being a potentially habitable place. So all these instruments put together a picture of Titan uh, that is uh, a world that in many ways has a balance of geological processes like the earth, the, the weather, the fluvial processes, um, even some evidence for tectonic plates that have been broken apart. The other thing that Huygens found for us is that even away from the lakes and seas that the Cassini orbiter discovered, where Huygens landed, there's liquid methane just below the surface, the, the probe being uh, warm. Uh, actually vaporized that material from the surface and was able to measure it as it evaporated uh, into the probe's mass spectrometer. So there are organic molecules all over the place, and that leads to the natural question, could those organic molecules be participating in some kind of life? It's really very, very speculative to ask the question, could life exist in the methane seas, for example? So that's a possibility. Another is that deep down in the interior of Titan, Cassini found evidence for a liquid water ocean. These were very, very subtle measurements of changes in the shape of Titan as it moved around in its elliptical orbit around Saturn. And so maybe life exists in this subterranean liquid water ocean. The third possibility, however, is that um, impacts on the surface, which happen, there are some large craters. Uh, which would have melted the water ice crust. Those might have provided habitats, temporary habitats for life. And in a large impact crater, parts of the melts under the surface remain liquid for quite some time. I think most intriguing is that in these uh, frozen remnants of the impacts, in these impact craters, there might be frozen in organic molecules that are the product of um, a prebiotic evolution toward life. That's one of the things I love about Titan too, is that it inspires such amazing missions that are flyers or, or yeah. uh, boats that will go in the sea. So Dragonfly is the next mission to Titan. This is not one of your you know, small drones that's the size of a, of, a, of a mouse or something. It's like a Volkswagen Beetle with uh, propellers on it. And so, this will be um, um, aerial exploration. It's the equivalent of the Mars rovers, but instead of wheels uh, with propellers. Uh, and that's really the way to get around Titan. So it carries instruments that can analyze uh, carbon bearing molecules, organic molecules. And the, the hope is to be able to start with um, the organics in the dune fields and then um, have Dragonfly work its way uh, to places where Perhaps there might have been um, melts of some kind where the ice might have melted due to impacts. And along those lines, you are also on the science team for uh, for the Europa Clipper mission. Um, and I think Europa, Jupiter's moon Europa, really captures the imagination, perhaps more than any other ocean world outside of Earth. It's just an incredibly beautiful and interesting world. Could you just summarize what the evidence is for the subsurface ocean that is thought to exist under the ice crust of Europa? And how big is that ocean? There is an outer layer about 200 kilometers that's made of water. But the interesting thing about Europa is it's in an elliptical orbit around Jupiter. And that elliptical orbit, that shape is maintained by Europa's interactions with the other moons, uh, Io and Ganymede, principally Ganymede. They're in what's called a resonance. That orbit um, provides heat. Essentially, it's like taking a tennis ball and squeezing it repeatedly 
And what you end up with is a warm tennis ball. Europa is moving in the plane of Jupiter's equator, and so it feels this wobbling magnetic field. When you have a time varying magnetic field like that, um, <clears throat> if that's passing through an electrical conductor like salty liquid water, then um, that time varying magnetic field will generate an electric field, electric currents. And those electric currents will generate a secondary magnetic field, what's called an induced magnetic field. And the Galileo orbiter detected an induced magnetic field, pretty much exactly what you would expect if Europa has this vast, somewhat salty ocean under the ice crust. The ocean itself, the liquid water part of Europa, has twice the volume of the Earth's oceans. So it's double the volume of our own oceans. Um, that's plenty of room for whales, by the way, if you're interested in those. I love that Europa has become this kind of uh, node of space whale talk, <laughs> you know? Uh, so it's right. fun to think of these macro um, animals that could be in there. But um, is when you mention the hydrothermal systems, I mean, that's often talked about as a possible way that life might have emerged on Earth or one possible origin. How would Europa Clipper... You know, try to resolve these sorts of questions of whether there's microbes or, you know, especially yeah. hope. <laughs> so Europa Clipper is actually designed to determine what we call the habitability of the ocean. Before we look for life, we have to answer several questions. One is, are there carbon bearing molecules in the ocean? Are there organic molecules and what is their nature? Um, is there evidence for energy sources that could power life? And it will tell us if in fact this ocean um, is uh, contains organics, the extent to which it's salty, um, and uh, so, and information on on energy sources, and from that it'll be possible to put together um, a, a follow-on mission if things look like they're favorable uh, for for landing to, uh, to to detect life, to detect the molecules of life. So Europa Clipper will kind of be the scout that possibly could see these plumes and, and then make some of these detections. Yep. What are the challenges then of that step two where you might have to land? The biggest challenge is radiation. Uh, that powerful magnetic field of Jupiter generates uh, a radiation field that's not only deadly, but um, it's damaging to spacecraft electronics. So Europa Clipper will be in a, a very elliptical orbit of Jupiter. It will make flybys of Europa, but not orbit Europa. And then what about these even more uh, interesting concepts of uh, having heat drills go through the ice or submarines, submersibles that could get into the ocean? Yeah, I mean, they're fantastic ideas. The challenge is um, spending that amount of time on the surface to do that kind of drilling and, and what that does to spacecraft components in that radiation environment. Well, you're also an expert on Saturn's moon Enceladus and the principal investigator of this mission, Enceladus Life Finder. Enceladus makes it a little bit easier, right? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about why this moon would be a little bit uh, more conducive to searching for life? It's a thousand times smaller in volume than Titan. Uh, it's only 500 kilometers across, 300 miles across in diameter. But it, it apparently has been tidally heated in the past. It, it, it may be tidally heated today. There are arguments about that. Whatever the heat source is, right now we know that Enceladus has the basic ingredients needed for life. Uh, the acidity of the ocean is a little strange. It's kind of got a high pH, so it's very alkaline, but, <clears throat> but not enough to, uh, to make it sterile. Uh, and so um, the next step is to go back and look for life. Would it be able to um, both determine if it's habitable and also potentially inhabited? So these other instruments, these mass spectrometers, um, would be um, powerful enough to detect the molecules of life and to measure the, their relative abundances and the kinds of molecules to tell us whether those patterns are um, typical of biology or of non-biological systems. So I sometimes like to tell people we're not looking to detect the life directly. We're looking to detect the, the scat, the poo coming from the life, the metabolic products that life in the ocean is producing. Well, if it were up to me, this would be launched yesterday, but I'm wondering hey. what the status of... Uh... Uh, of the mission is right now. I mean, there's such an abundance of great ideas out there. 
and um, we're not the only ones now with this idea. Others have, have come along as well. So I'm confident that someone sometime in the not too distant future will put together a mission like this uh, and NASA will select it and we'll be going to Enceladus to look for life. And I personally hope that it's ELF and it's my team. But to be honest, science is a worldwide endeavor and whoever does it, as long as we get the answers, that's really what counts.